I know many of us would love to see an end time revival, but I would also like to see inside the church itself a revival of the Olivet Discourse, a new passion for what the Lord talks about when he discusses his return and gives us the signs that we are to be looking for. I would love for that to happen. There are a couple of lies about the Olivet Discourse that are standing in the way for some people to embrace the Olivet Discourse, and here they are. It's not the rapture of the church, it's the second coming. That is completely wrong. Lie number two, it was for the Jews. Now, that may be saying the same thing as lie number one, but in a different way, but we want to deal with both of those separately. Even though most of you do not believe either one of those lies, you're going to see how we can debunk them because of the special integration the Holy Spirit has provided between the Olivet Discourse and the book of Revelation. It's brilliant, absolutely stunning. When you see the brilliance in everything the Holy Spirit does, it's amazing. Now, to be honest, uh, I was going to really rebuke those who believe and teach and promote either one of those lies. And I was really going to go after them. And then I thought, you know, yes, they're wrong, and they are, and those are dangerous lies. But look at me, you know? I mean, the Revelation 12 sign came, happened in our in our watch, and I just stood around and watched it for a while and said, yeah, it looks like it. And when nothing happened, instead of investigating it and trying to find out why did we see something out of chapter 12? What does the Revelation 12 sign mean to us? I just kind of shrugged my shoulders and moved on. And, and so, you know, I was thinking about that. Who am I to call them out? So in the spirit of end time harmony, I'm, I'm going to present the material in a more amicable fashion to them in hopes that they will see the truth. And to be honest, though, Still in the back of my mind, that little, I don't know, subconscious voice, you know, is telling me something different. But You coward. Listen to me. Give it to him good. Bring down fire from heaven. Oh. Do it. Fall them into hell where they belong. No, now stop. Stop. I don't want to hear any more from you. Your sister is smarter than you. Maybe that's not my subconscious voice. Maybe, maybe I'm going insane. Maybe I'm going crazy. No. That's a good point. That's a good point. Thank you. You're welcome, my friend. All right. Let's begin with point falsehood number one. It's the second coming. He's talking about the second coming. Now, when we say second coming, do I even have to tell you what it means? Of course not. We all, we all understand the, the general premise of the second coming. That's it. That's it. Satan is chained. We're ready for the thousand-year millennial kingdom and possibly judgment. I mean, it's an ending event, a complete ending, and a, then a millennial kingdom reign, uh, the second coming. But fortunately for us, in the Olivet Discourse, the Lord mentions some events leading up to his coming that will completely disprove the notion that he's talking about the second coming. He is not. He tells us about, as a sign to look for his coming, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. We can now take those events and go to the book of Revelation to get more information about them. And in so doing, you will see beyond any shadow of a doubt he is not speaking of the second coming in the Olivet Discourse. Let's begin with the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Over the last couple of weeks, a couple of videos, we've talked about that. It's war in heaven. That's what he's talking about. This gigantic event that is coming will precede, but only barely, 
his coming. When he comes, he's coming in victory. He has just thrown Satan out of heaven and out of the heavens. So let's go to the book of Revelation and get some more information about that war in heaven. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, that would be us, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they, us, overcame him. You see, the church just moved from overcome to overcame. This is the end of the church age that we're seeing. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. And then we see that he brings forth the beast out of the sea, and the false prophet, and 666, and eventually Armageddon. In other words, there's a long string of events that Satan will be involved with once he has been thrown out of heaven. It's not the end. In the Olivet Discourse, our Lord tells us, when you see that war in heaven, and you will, in some form or fashion, because men are going to faint when they see what's happening. He says, when you see that, start looking up, because your redemption draws near. And then you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with great power and glory. But it's not the end. Satan will continue. He's not being chained for a thousand years. He's not even close to that yet. This is not the second coming. It is a reset. The church moves from earth to heaven. Satan moves from heaven to earth. The whole world is aware that something very bizarre is going on, but it's not the end. We are not ready for the millennial kingdom. Satan has a long string of events that he will bring forth before his demise at Armageddon. It's not the second coming. The second coming is when he's chained for a thousand years. We're a long way from that based on what Jesus told us at the Olivet Discourse. And then we go to the book of Revelation and we get more information about those events. There's even more proof than just that. That alone would be enough to tell me or you, if you're a truth seeker, this is not the second coming. It's a big deal, but it's not the second coming. It's not the end. One of the other keys that he told us to look for, stars falling from heaven. That is also part of war in heaven. It's the result of the war in heaven. The angels being kicked out of heaven to earth. We see that in the second vision of chapter 12 of Revelation. After seeing the first vision, which we call the Revelation 12 sign, he sees another vision. He sees the fiery red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and diadems, and his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven, and they were cast to earth. Those are the angels. Stars falling from heaven are the bad angels coming to earth. So when we go to the sixth seal, we are told once again, stars falling from heaven. This is the incoming bad angels along with Satan. So what do we see next? What we see next is John sees the 144,000 being sealed. They begin their mission. God calls out 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. Notice that during the church age, Paul tells us there is neither Jew nor Gentile, male or female, free or slave. It's, we are one in Christ. But the church age just ended, and now God is calling out Israel, 12,000 from each tribe. And they have a mission to accomplish. We see them later on in the book of Revelation where they're called first fruits. What are they the first fruits of? They are the first fruits of the final phase, which is the blindness coming off of Israel. But the point I'm trying to make here today is, once again, there's a long progression of events that now has to take place involving the 144,000. 
It'll also bring in the two witnesses and a bunch of other things, but it's not the end. Just as when Satan is thrown to earth, not the end, not the second coming. War in heaven and stars falling from the heavens to the earth is not the end. It is the end of the church age, but it is the beginning of the final phase. There is a whole lot more to be accomplished. It is not the second coming. That should be patently obvious to anybody who is a truth seeker. The second lie, he was talking to the Jews. This is the one that's really rather dangerous. Bring the heat. No. Now stop that. So when they say he's talking to the Jews, well, of course he was talking to the Jews. He was in Israel. He came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They were given the first opportunity to join the new covenant. But but they aren't saying, well, he was talking to Jews because they were the disciples and they were all Jewish. That lie is talking about he's not talking to the church. He's giving instructions to the Jews much later on. He's skipping over the church and going to his coming for the Jews at the end. So really, once again, lie number two is probably very similar to lie number one. But the thing that really bothers me about lie number two is it introduces this idea that, well, gee, we've got to go through the entire gospel all four Gospels, and try and determine when Jesus is talking to the church and when he's talking to Jews. No, no, we don't. No, we don't. When he's talking to the Jews, if he ever in the four Gospels is specifically only talking to the Jews, it will be evident. It will be so crystal clear there won't be any any need for discussion about it. For instance, when he talks about the destruction of the temple, he mentions Jerusalem, he mentions Israel, he mentions the, the children of Israel, he mentions everything Jewish. But when he's talking about his coming, he doesn't talk about Israel. He, that word doesn't come out of his mouth. Neither, neither does the word Jews, for that matter. When he says, what I tell you, I tell everyone. He could have said, what I say to you, I say to all of Israel, but he didn't. He's not talking to them. This idea that we've got to try and figure out, when is he talking to the Jews? Could you imagine? <clears throat> Let me show you how ridiculous the statement is, he was talking to the Jews. Oh, come on. He came here to build his church. He, he is just a couple of days from going to the cross for his church that he is building. And he's talking to the founding members of that church, and he wants them to know that when he goes away, when he tells them in a couple of nights that he's going away, he is returning, and he's returning in victory. That's important for the church to know. Could you imagine if a new Christian came to me and said, hey, when, when can I take Holy Communion? I, I, I'm really looking forward to my first Holy Communion. And I stupidly said to him, Oh, no, no, that's not for you. When Jesus had the Last Supper, that was, that, the whole communion was given to the Jews during a week-long Jewish festival, during the most important Jewish dinner of the year. That's, was, that's not to Gentiles. That was given to Jews. Do, do you and your family celebrate the Passover meal? Well, no. Then you don't take Holy Communion. How horrible would that be? How horrible would that be? No, we aren't supposed to go through the Gospels trying to figure out Jews or church, Jews or church. That's ridiculous. But there's even better proof because the events that he's talking about are intrinsically involving the church. Here's one way that you can take a look at that. Two events that he's associating with his coming in the Olivet Discourse. Once again, stars falling from heaven and the sun and the moon not giving its light. We see both of those at the sixth seal because it's the same event. It's the coming of our Lord that he talks about at the Olivet Discourse. Those same events are happening at the sixth seal because it's the same event. And what do we see? John looks into heaven and sees the Gentile nations, all of them. Every tongue, every bloodline, every country, they're all there. It's a sea of people that can't be numbered. There's so many. It's the church. It's the Gentile church because the church age has just ended. Once again, when we saw war in heaven, we are told the brethren, us, move from overcome to overcame. So once again, the events that Jesus is talking about in the Olivet Discourse have an enormous impact 
on the Gentile church. Yeah, it also has an impact, impact on the Jewish nation. It also has an impact on the world in general. But he's not just talking to the Jews. He's talking to the founding members of his church, and the church plays a key role in the very things he mentions in the Olivet Discourse. These two lies have got to go. But I'm not going to beg people to see that, because if you can't see it, you're not going to see it. I've given you enough information that if you're a truth seeker, you, you will understand what I'm saying here, and that the proof in the book of Revelation supports the idea that Jesus is coming back for his church. For crying out loud, he even talks about a loud trump, and he sends out his angels to gather his elect at the Olivet Discourse at his coming. Don't think for a second that the people who promote these lies came about them academically and honestly. In other words, they read the Olivet Discourse and said, this sounds like the second coming to me. Or, uh, this sounds like he's not talking to the church, but talking to the Jews. No, no, nobody would ever come to that conclusion on their own. They came to that conclusion because they came up with the timeline. And then they come to the Olivet Discourse and they go, we've got a problem. We've got a problem. And the only fix they could come up with was, let's make the Olivet Discourse go away. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's, to, it's not even to the church. It's not even him coming for the church in the rapture. It's the second coming. They had to come up with something, and that's what they came up with. They should have thrown their timeline away and embraced the Olivet Discourse. They have another chance to do that right now. All will be forgiven. All will be forgiven. Do the right thing. We're all correcting some mistakes that we've made in the past prophetically. We're also correcting some mistakes, period, that we've made in the past, but we've all made prophetic eschatology-type mistakes. It's time to get it straight and to get it straight now. These lies have to go. I've talked about the three event lines many times. We came to this conclusion by just last two years as he led us to important truths about the book of Revelation. It was there that I saw the importance of the Revelation 12 sign. It was always scheduled to appear right before war in heaven and the coming of our Lord. You know, if 2,000 years ago, right after the book of Revelation was given, if the early church had come to the knowledge of these three event lines, you know what they would have said? They would have looked at him down the road and said, okay, we see the top line is the church age and all of that. They got that right. And then we have the God line and then we have the Satan line. Look at that period of time that begins with the Revelation 12 sign and then it leads to war in heaven followed by the coming and the appearance of our Lord. Could you imagine, they would say, living in that time, how blessed those people would be that they not only saw the Revelation 12 sign, most of them will live to see the coming of the Lord. They would call us the most blessed generation since the giving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and they'd be right. We are a blessed group of Christians, yet I, there's like this malaise, this collective brain fog that we have that we don't quite realize the importance of that. We're that group. Now, there's a downside of being that group. As one commenter on, the, uh, on some alternative news site that I went to was talking about the world, he said the world reminds him of an open-air, free-range, insane asylum. That's the other side of being this blessed generation. We are watching the, the earth head down the sewer right before the Lord comes. That's the downside. I'll take it to be part of the group that will be here when he shows up. And, and the, the three big signs that he talks about in the Olivet Discourse, signs in the sun, the moon, and the constellations slash stars, the sea and the wave roaring, and men's hearts failing as they see what's coming upon the earth because there is war in heaven. When you read it in the Gospels, it's that, that typical voice that the Holy Spirit has of straightforward matter of fact. We have to provide the urgency and the awe to those words because each of those events is mind-blowing, and we, we need to reinvigorate ourselves when we read it. 
because it's said in the same tone of voice that the, the Holy Spirit might have written. And so the next day they got up and journeyed to Damascus or something, you know. But it's it's these things are spectacular, and we're living in the time. So to in a in a in a lame attempt to really try and infuse some excitement into these words, let's add appropriate music and read them once again. Now, I'm not a narrator, but it's, it's not my voice I want you to listen to. I want you to see the words written by the Holy Spirit from the mouth of our Lord, the events he wants us to take special note of, the ones that herald his soon appearing. And they are massive events, and we've already experienced one. And there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. <laughs> 